Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Recon Village again. Thanks for everyone who managed to come all the way over to um, Planet Hollywood again. Um, I know we're in kind of the furthest realms of all of the hotels, so I do really appreciate you coming over here. We have got another jam-packed day, so if you were here yesterday, thanks very much for coming back. Uh, we have got a comprehensive talk to start the day, so I will get straight over to the boys to hand over. Uh, the title is on the screen, uh, Hack to Basics. Um, if you did not catch Anthony and Jake yesterday, they were over in the Flamingo um, with a workshop. Um, so if you did not catch them there, they will probably continue what we're doing in here. They've got a wealth of experience between the two of them, and this is certainly not their first DEF CON. Um, so without further ado, I will pass over to them right now. Thanks very much, guys. All right, so let's get started. Uh, this is Hack to Basics, adapting exploit frameworks to evade uh, Microsoft ATP. Uh, like they said, I'm Anthony, I go by coin. Uh, my background uh, is electrical engineering. Uh, this is the second DEF CON now that I've spoken at. Um, I'm a lock picking hobbyist. Uh, I've done a lot of work in Bluetooth uh, over the years, uh, and especially working at. Uh oh. We're good? Okay. All right. Is that better? Perfect. All right. So uh, wireless security really is my passion, so I do a lot of work in wireless security and embedded systems. Yeah, and then I'm Jake Krasnov. I go by Hubble. Uh, I started off doing satellite engineering stuff and then when I was uh, in the military in a pr previous life they actually f started me uh, in cyber kind of not by choice but it ended up being a great thing and I really enjoyed it. Uh, after that I kind of went into a red team uh, role for a little while and now I do embedded security like architecture stuff and it's been pretty fun so far. Uh, so just a quick overview of what we're going to be going over. Uh, we're going to introduce Empire real quick just in case some people in the room aren't familiar with it and go over some of the current shortfalls, demonstrate how to employ some recon against an organization and not just the organization but also researching like what kind of software and stuff they're running if you get, you're lucky enough to get that kind of information. Uh, show how to weaponize Microsoft Azure with some interesting uh, information we found about Outlook 365 and Azure and how they overlap over each other. And then deploying that attack, a like phishing, spear phishing attack with uh, Outlook and Microsoft Word. So why are we here? Like, what we purposely chose for this assessment, we purposely chose to use an older framework like Empire because we think a lot of people in the red team space are kind of obsessed with the, like the newest shiny toy. And as soon as you see any hint of something being flagged or caught, they're like, "Oh, that tool's burned," and move on to the next thing. Um, and that's not really true. Like a lot of these older frameworks still work with very minor adjustments to them and still bypass like even advanced like intrusion detection systems and stuff like that. And you don't need to use C sharp or those new hotness things to, uh, to get past these things. Just show, share experiences from the attacking like a robust network. This assessment, it was just the two of us kind of working out of our houses against like some fairly large companies or you know, technology employed by fairly large companies like Darktrace, Mimecast, like Microsoft ATP and things like that. And then uh, Anthony's going to go do the quick overview for Empire real quick. Uh, so we chose Empire as our post exploitation framework. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are pretty familiar with it. Uh, it's been out for a little while. Uh, came out back at B-Sides back in 2015. Uh, if you're not aware, however, it's no longer being maintained as of two weeks ago. Uh, so we really did choose an outer date framework for our assessment. Uh, it has a lot of things built into it that makes it really easy for us. So the adaptability for the modules as well as the encrypted C2 channel. Uh, maybe you're wondering why we're still choosing PowerShell. Well, you have full .NET access, uh, direct access to the uh, Win32 API. Uh, you can operate completely in memory. Uh, it's installed by default on Windows and most of your network admins are still running this so with our hopes for our assessment was the network admin had PowerShell enabled. Uh, for uh, Empire for its payloads, uh, it typically does multi stages for its payload. So you originally have your initial payload that goes out and then it goes in steps to deploy its full framework and it operates completely in memory. Some of the big shortfalls for Empire that we found, uh, once again, it's relatively old in terms of hacking. So 2015 is an old framework. Uh, many of the modules and signatures built into it have already been flagged, uh, which is a big issue for us if we don't want to go uh, detected. And then it's no longer being maintained. So we're going to have to make all the changes ourselves. We want to keep moving forward. 
Uh, our initial plan moving in, uh, you can see there, there's us. We wanted to use a cloud infrastructure uh, to set up our, our uh, listener. We wanted to then move into the network uh, going through their firewall. Uh, we knew they were running dark trace, so we wanted to evade that and we wanted to deliver our payload through Outlook, uh, probably using probably a macro of some sort embedded into a Word doc. So that was our initial plan moving forward into our assessment. So what we did is we started with our recon. We knew who it was. Uh, we have a couple choices on how you want to conduct your recon. You can be asked, you can get paid, or you can be upset with them. Uh, for us, we weren't getting paid and we weren't upset, so we were asked to do this assessment. Uh, we did some scans on, on their servers to figure out what's going on. Uh, they moved pretty much everything into a cloud infrastructure, uh, but we did find a lot of personal information on their website, which we found really useful. So for their organization, this is the financial advisor union. Uh, I'm not giving away the real information of this company. That was the one thing they asked us not to do was to talk about them specifically. So uh, we're going to be targeting one person, specifically Kevin for now. So we're going to go over Kevin and look at some of the information that he, they have on the website about him that we might find really good for us. So uh, we can derive a lot of information from just his profile. Uh, we found that they have phone numbers for these employees on their website. Uh, they have email addresses, they have work addresses, as well as social media accounts, uh, as well as personal or uh, professional certifications. Uh, pretty much 90% of all the employees at this place had the same professional uh, certification and we thought that, hey, maybe we can use this personal, this professional certification as a way to convince people to maybe check out some of the stuff that we're going to send to them for our spear phishing attack. So we did a little bit more research looking into CFP. Uh, they had a whole website dedicated to it. Uh, it's a certification specifically for financial professionals. Uh, and most of the people in our target organization held the certification. So we went some more searching on their website. Uh, they have a lot of functionality built to it. Specifically, if you're searching for a financial advisor that you want to hire, you can put in their information and it will pop back um, a bunch of stuff for them. So you can see here is I can enter just their name um, and it will give me a search result back on these people. So looking up Kevin, I can search Kevin now. Uh, I can find his work address, which I already had from before, as well as company. Uh, hopefully it's the right Kevin. Uh, disciplinary history as well as bankruptcy. Uh, so now that I have all this information as well as some other information we gathered from his social media account, we can now start targeting these people uh, specifically. So, so then we also start researching some of the uh, software we knew they were running on their network. We, they want us to run this largely as a uh, black box text, test so they didn't really tell us like where their servers were or what the IP addresses or anything like that were. Really the only thing they told us was that they were running dark trace because uh, they had just, it was kind of the new toy they had gotten there and they were kind of proud that they were running it. So we went and did a bunch of research on it because we didn't really know exactly what it was at the time. And it turns out it's a kind of a next gen intrusion detection system that's using like AI and machine learning to do like network baselining where they're looking for is the end, is the uh, website that someone's going to like an unusual one they don't, people don't normally go to that one. Uh, what are the network baselines in terms like when are you, users specifically normally on the network, like what hours and how much data are they transferring day to day and that kind of stuff. And it also uses J3 signatures which we'll talk about a little more in a second. Um, so we actually doing this uh, found an article about dark trace specifically hunting empire on uh, using these J3 signatures which are a way of fingerprinting like TLS handshakes without needing to be able to decrypt encrypted traffic. Uh, but it was really convenient because they, they were talking about hunting empire and then at the bottom of their article they actually gave a bunch of caveats about how you can go through and change your JA3 signature so it doesn't match anymore. And so after that we started researching Office 365 because we, we knew they were running Outlook um, as well just based on some of the emails that had gone back and forth uh, between them or between us. And it turns out that if you start looking at the Office 365 endpoints, there's a web API where they say, they give all the IP addresses that have to be whitelisted through your firewall and that kind of stuff so that Office 365 will work. And we go look up uh, the Azure IP spaces um, as well. They actually overlap um, pretty significantly for a, in a, quite a number of places. Um, like specifically like the 52108 slash 16 subnet, almost half of that entire subnet uh, was contained inside the Azure space as well. Um, and like just the, the up there is an example of the 
uh, Asia Southeast region, all those addresses up there are actually inside of the Office 365 uh, whitelisted space as well. So what we want to do is kind of weaponize Azure to try and get inside that common IP space. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get do that. We tried uh, for about a week, like getting new IP addresses over and over again to try and get inside there. We got really close, and the IP addresses do shift slightly. That's why the uh, API exists, so they can up as they update them, they can uh, they can uh, sorry organizations can update their whitelists as well. And so we were hoping that maybe being really close, our IP space had been contained in there at one point. Um, so we went ahead and used that and then Azure actually already has a Kali uh, image uploaded there and you can just stand up a server with Kali on it really easily. Their Kali is a little weird for some reason, they, like the commands don't run as like root by default and we had a hard time installing PowerShell and stuff on it so there, it's a little weird but it, it does have all the tools and everything you need to stand it up. Oh, one, one thing we, we did learn, you, you can't pay for Microsoft Azure using gift cards. So don't try that. They, uh, they banned gift cards completely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so our new plan was to, you know, use Azure as our cloud space to try and make it not look like a uh, outlier endpoint when we did have callbacks from our, from our targets and hopefully Darktrace had seen our IP, our IP address before and we wouldn't, j we just wouldn't get flagged at all. So, we went through also and made a bunch of updates to Empire like we talked about. Uh, apologize. Um, so the master branch is out of date. Like the master branch is really old. It hasn't had any updates pushed to it in like two or three years. So like invoke obfuscation has issues. Uh, PS inject is broken because of uh, Microsoft updated the way some of the uh, commandlets work in PowerShell. So you have to update those. Um, they fixed a lot of that in their dev branch. If you go to it and download the dev branch specifically, a lot of those things have been corrected, but the main branch still doesn't really work and you will get caught because it's, it's so well known for um, across like multiple um, IDSs and that kind of stuff. So what we had to fix, like I said, they updated a lot of the stuff like Mimi Cats and Invoke Obfuscation to the latest versions inside of the dev branch. But we also went through, modified our JA3 signatures, um, fixed the default launch commands inside of there because they were tacking on an extra, um, an extra launcher that was actually breaking it a little bit. And then we updated the AMSI bypasses to have our little own flavor just to change the signature up, up a little bit. And there was a bug in the HTTP listener that actually caused a signature to the AMSI was using to flag the, our scripts as well. Um, so this just shows like what our J3, um, what our TLS handshake looked like initially. Um, the J3 signature is hashing a bunch of fields in your, T in your TLS handshake. And the easiest one to change is that cipher suite that I have in that red box. You can go in and, you know, make some very complicated changes to your code. So it just takes adding this like single line inside of your HTTP server and the, on the Python web server and your JA3 signature changes completely. As well as just a single line inside of our PowerShell agent to change the JA3 signature there. Um, so invoke obfuscation, like I said, is probably the most common like issue reported on the Empire project. Like there's just hundreds of people saying like, oh, obfuscation is broken. It's not really broken. Um, the default command is just not set up properly. Um, and the dev branch fixed some of those, but some of them also still have like broken commands in them. But you can just update that command in that field where I have it running uh, using the obfuscate command. Um, but if you just go to the token all one, which is the default in invoke obfuscation, it doesn't use a truly random um, obfuscation setup. It uses a semi random and it's been run so many times and used that when you, even if you use that token all one to obfuscate your payload, the signature gets flagged because it just all of the variations of that obfuscation have been seen. So if you use a custom order, um, like as you can see, it might be a little hard to read up there, but if you use a custom order of commands for off invoke obfuscation, your payloads will still get past most um, AVs when they do like file scanning and that kind of stuff. And then uh, the default PowerShell launcher actually had a couple of issues in it as well. Um, the first one was the AMSI bypass they were using. Um, they were using the bypass published by Matt Graber and it doesn't have any obfuscation in it and it, so the default, it was published in 2016 so it's been seen a lot and gets flagged but it takes, again, it takes some very simple changes. All you have to do is concatenate the AMSI utils to break it apart so that signature is not there and the AMSI init failed and the bypass will go through. So it, it takes like 30 seconds to update it. 
and then there was a bug in the code which was really interesting because even after we fixed that the um AMZ bypass from being flagged it was we were still getting picked up and we couldn't figure out for a long time why we were getting picked up and it turned out that there was a bug in the code that was adding this um headers dot add uh, user agent command twice in there and AMZ evaluates script box as a whole in context and it, that repeated command was enough to create a signature for AV to start flagging on it. So you remove that that command being repeated twice and now our payload uh works gets past um defender out of the box without needing to run like invoke obfuscation and that kind of stuff on it. All right, so how do we convince our users now to uh click on our payload, launch it and that way we get a call back out of their network. So uh we need to build a believable Word doc because that's what we're going to employ. We just chose Word doc because it would probably be the easiest for us. Uh, we're going to embed our payload uh, with uh, Visual Basic into that Word doc. We got to send that convincing email to hopefully get past junk mail and then hope that the user clicks on the uh, email and opens the Word doc and enables the, uh, uh, the macro. So we got a lot of stuff. So first we just go to the web page. Pretty easy. Uh, we're going to grab the header, throw that on our Word doc, try to make it as convincing as possible. Uh, go back to Kevin. We're going to grab all that personal information that we had earlier and we're going to start adding it into our Word doc just like this. Now, this alone is not going to be able to get us to get them to open the, or not just open the Word doc, but enable macros. Because the only way to make changes to our Word doc is to enable macros. So we're going to purposely embed bad information in there. So when they look at this, they're going to be like, oh, look, th my information's not quite right. And in our email that we send out, we're going to try to get them to open and be like, hey, our, our database is being updated and you need to update this form and then send it in. So as they go through and add all that stuff in, they're going to have to go back and make edits to make sure it's correct. Uh, they send out a lot of newsletters and surveys all the time. Um, I signed up for their stuff to kind of do some recon on that. Um, and this is some of the stuff that would pop out of there. So they'd ask, what other certifications do you have? you know, how long have you been doing your job uh, and then what kind of education you have. So we took that as well, threw it in there just to add a little bit of more noise into our Word doc. And then finally, uh, after we put all the information in there, uh, we wanted to kind of give some feedback to the user so we put a submit button in there. Um, so when they click on it, it actually doesn't do anything. All it does is gives them say, hey, look, your form was sent. But at least that way when they put in all their information, they hit a button, they get that good feeling that at least they accomplished something. Uh, we're going to take our AMSI or our Empire payload that we made earlier. We're going to embed it into our Microsoft uh, macro enabled document. So we're going to send that uh, using our email that we built. Uh, this email is pretty much pulled almost exactly from a newsletter that they sent out. Um, so we pulled, we, we formatted exactly like that, telling them, hey, guess what? Our system is being updated. If you want to maintain your membership, you got to go in, update your information, hit submit, and then your uh, account won't be suspended. Uh, we try to make it as urgent as possible so that way they hopefully they'll be able to submit uh, that form. Oh yeah, Just ahead. a quick interjection. Uh, when you're making the Microsoft documents, uh, Word, if you try to save with the uh, current format, like the 2013 format and earlier, it forces you to add save as a macro-enabled document, so it has a dot doc m at the end. But if you save it as a 2007 form, it just it still just says the dot doc. So you 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 don't show up as having a macro-enabled document if you save it as an older format rather than the new format. And a lot of email um, services will filter out the, the uh, dot doc m one, so it's good to make sure that we're we're keeping it so that way it gets through with the kind of to maximize our chances. So now that we have our document, our email, everything's ready to go. Uh, we're going to run a test using an email account that we own to c make sure that this all works. So uh, we didn't want to just throw it out there in the wild and hope that it works. We wanted to do kind of a trial run. So we launch it. We get, we get a call back, we're really excited, we're really happy, and then we stop and think for a minute and be like, wait, we sent the email, however we never opened it, why am I getting a call back? Uh, so that's a bit of a problem. Uh, so we're looking here, we have our call back, we're a little confused, and then we look at the name, we're like, Sarah Sims. Yeah, I'm not Sarah, he's not Sarah. Who the hell is this person and why do they have my malware? Uh, so there, what turns out is that uh, our attack failed and we're not sure why. Uh, so, you know, being crafty as we were, um, we decided why don't we just send a bunch of payloads now, get all these callbacks and hopefully we can figure out what's going on. Uh, and it turns out this original plan that we came up with for launching everything into their network, uh, it's not going to work. Uh, it turns out that Microsoft has 
uh, built now ATP processes that they have in place into their regular non-ATP accounts uh, that adds a sandbox. So all these emails that you send out now, Microsoft is taking them, putting them into a sandbox environment and checking them to see if they execute or have any callbacks out of them. Uh, so this is happening. There's no documentation at all on this. Uh, so just so you're aware, all your emails are being scanned by Microsoft. Big surprise. Yeah, so a sandbox, just real quick, it could be anything from where you're isolating an individual process to running like an entire virtual machine to analyze the behavior of a attachment or a piece of malware if you're doing like uh, analysis on your own. Um, so when they start using these for the emails, it's because it's way easier to do behavioral analysis than try and create every single signature. Or well, easier is not the right word, but it's it's a more reliable way because you still have to do if you're launching a payload, you still have to have things like your C2 callback, your, um, you know, launching new processes and things like that. So the behavioral analysis is a more reliable way than using signatures. So they've started using those, but we couldn't find, like he, Anthony said, we couldn't find any documentation that Outlook was using uh, sandboxes by default on all accounts, whether or not they're ATP or just plain old, like you so signed up and used a free one. So what we did was, we started, we decided that if we're getting all these callbacks, maybe we can use that to figure out what's going on because we tried using standard sandbox evasion techniques like launching the payload once the document was closed out, um, doing some time waiting, uh, not very long, just like a minute or two, doing some time waiting, um, and doing uh, like user inputs, like it won't launch unless there's some user inputs. And the sandbox is actually doing user inputs and that kind of stuff. It's a pretty advanced sandbox environment. So it was a little more difficult than we were expecting to evade it. So we want to try and enumerate the sandbox um, environment to see if there was any, we could get any information back that was a reliable indicator that we were in that sandbox. So our first attempt was just a super lazy, uh, we sent an enumeration thing that made a text file and tried to copy it directly back to our server. And uh, the sandbox did not like it when we tried to copy a file off, so it just killed our connection immediately. We didn't even get like a full callback that time. Um, so we ended up um, changing the second stage of the Empire payload to enumerate um, the, the uh, host with looking for things like identification numbers, uh, disk size, RAM, that kind of stuff to see if like the physical configuration of the sandbox was the same the, every time. And it turned out that it was. So every time you ran, you got the same serial number back or identification number, the same number of cores and the same disk size every time, even though the IP addresses, the domain names, the usernames, all of that stuff was changing every time, the physical indicators were exactly the same every time. So we were able to build that a uh, build that look uh, that check into our payload, and it immediately went through the sandbox without any issues from that point forward. Every single time, um, and we actually reported this to Microsoft, saying like, "Hey, it's probably not a good idea that your your sandbox allows the C2 server to connect." Um, it ended up being fixed in about July, but as far as we can tell, it wasn't intentional because they hadn't gotten back to us. And the email they did send back to us said, uh, "We verified your issues, but we're not going to do anything about it. We, we might fix it in the future." Um, and so now we're going to go ahead and try and launch the attack again. Now that we've identified that sandbox, so uh, launching the attack. Uh, now that we have all the information, at least we think we had all the information, uh, we launch our attack. Uh, we made it through the sandbox. Congratulations. Um, however, for some reason, you know, uh, no one is totally clicking our totally legit uh, phishing campaign. Can't imagine why. Uh, come to find out that our really great phishing campaign that we came up with um, doesn't work because uh, since we're doing a black box, uh, can't talk, black box test, uh, they're employing Mimecast. Uh, so all their emails are being uh, placed into kind of a locker and the users have to manually um, pull them out to actually review them. So this organization ran a spear phishing kind of uh, assessment earlier in the year uh, to kind of see how their users were doing. And it, it, we found out at that point um, that less than 2% of their users were clicking these kind of emails anyway. So our chances were pretty slim to start off with anyway. Uh, so that was great for them. Uh, it was really bad for us, however. Uh, so we went in, uh, we talked to the network admin, uh, and he said, sure, you know what? 
I have a computer laying around. I'll execute this payload on my computer to see if dark trace is working because that's really what the whole intent was behind this. Uh, so he goes, he clicks on it. Uh, it works. We get a call back. We think everything's great. Uh, come to find out the network taps were misconfigured at this location. So they spent all this money uh, setting up an IDS, an IPS, and they misconfigured the entire thing. So uh, that kind of sucked for them. So we asked nicely again. He went to another location that they knew was actually properly configured. Uh, and they launched it from there and we did get a call back again. So uh, you can see there we blocked out all their personal information. We got a call back out of there uh, with Darktrace actually properly running. Uh, so our entire uh, attack was completely successful. Yeah, well, so, so we were successful in getting our, um, our, C2, uh, our C2 traffic not seen. Um, we weren't really able to lateral partly because um, the scope of our of our agreement for the assessment was that we couldn't drop anything to disk, which really limited our ability to like um, elevate our permissions and that kind of stuff because they didn't want us dropping like any DLLs. They wanted to be able to just hit the power button on the computer and it go back to where it was. Um, so that that limited us a lot. So we started getting noisier and noisier just from the single host that we had to try and enumerate it and that kind of uh, the network and that kind of stuff. And Darktrace did eventually, when we started doing like full network scans, that's a flag on the com on the computer. But they were Darktrace has a second component that you can buy called Anagena, which is a uh, intrusion prevention system. It's supposed to be an automated system for when it, if it sees bad actors to isolate that connection and cut it off and like isolate that computer. And even though we were getting we get had some alerts triggered, it never isolated us. So we were able to um, pull like a whole bunch of information off of the shared drives, um, enumerate their their network, and we found like a computer for uh, they found like a Windows 2003 server on their network, like. Um, so that kind of stuff. So it was the attack was successful in the terms of getting our C2 traffic passed, but we weren't really able to lateral because of the scope we had, and just also um, we hadn't entirely fixed some of the issues with like um, PS and Jet getting flagged and stuff in Empire at that point. We we managed to fix those a little later. Um, so the lessons learned, like the older frameworks are still viable. You know, we had we had a next gen IDS and all that stuff that's supposed to be doing all this network baselining and using these. Um, weak indicators of compromise that when when to put all together are able to produce like strong indicators and like really effective uh, analysis of the network. Um, but we were using an outdated framework and we were still able to get past it with relatively minor changes in the code base. And then um, avoiding Windows Defender and AMZ is not that hard, at least when you understand how they work. Um, you actually see a lot of things online about old techniques for bypassing Defender and AMSI that people are like, oh, these don't work anymore because it was flagged in this new update or something like that. And it really they just don't understand why AMSI is flagging on it. And it takes only a few strings being concatenated or like that to make those techniques still work. Um, and then uh, phishing just overall is still one of the most common uh, is the most common way of delivering malware, but the click rates across or, like organizations, like uh, you know, across the country. If you go look at the Verizon Wireless report that came out, like the click rates are getting really low, like less than five percent in most uh, in, in most um, companies, which is really great. It's it's great that we're finally getting to that point with things like Mimecast stuff uh, helping a lot, um, and then. Microsoft is rolling out more and more mitigations, and it's, that's also really great too. You know, their response to us, we would have liked to see them say that they were going to address some of the issues with the sandbox, but um, we understand really why, or we understand that they can't change everything like instantaneously, so hopefully they address that in the future. Um, and just non ATP accounts are getting better too, so. You guys got any questions for us? Sure. Oh, uh, sir, yep, yeah, you with the hat. Uh, so what was happening was we would get a connection back for like two to three minutes and then, it, and then it would cut off and it was the same time every time and when we looked up the IP addresses we were getting back they were all registered to Microsoft. Yeah, so we were, we were able to look up those IP addresses and after we got four or five of them back and it kept detonating they were, and they were all kind of in the same IP space um, and they were all registered to Microsoft so we were able to do that. Oh, I apologize, I forgot. The, the question was uh, how were we able to tell that we were in a sandbox uh, prior to, prior, without being told that when there was no documentation on it. Cool. So any other questions? Yes, sir. So 
So I was just curious, um, is there any other providers that you tested or they know of that have the sandbox um, not sabotaged by yet? Uh, so we're, the question was, are there any more advertisers that are using sandboxes that aren't advertised? I, we're not aware of any. Um, we haven't, I haven't been able to determine, uh, Google rolled out sandboxes for G Suite, but I haven't been able to determine if they're being used on just standard Gmail accounts or not. I haven't seen anything that indicates it, that they are. Um, because like all of our payloads were going, th like we we're having the issue with the Outlook, our payload was still going through on Gmail because we tested on that to see if it was some other issue um, and it didn't get detonated there. So we're not, th they were all making it through. So I'm not aware of them, anyone else putting unadvertised sandboxes in yet. Uh, cool, any other questions? Oh, cool. Thanks guys. Thank I appreciate you. it.